You are listening to Machine Learning That Works, a podcast hosted by Neton AI. Hi, I am Jakub Chakon. I'm a senior data scientist at Neptune AI, and today I'll be talking to Arash Azand. Arash is a chief AI scientist at Lindera, and we will be talking about how he got there and what you, me, and everyone else can learn from it. Without further ado, my interview with Arash Azand. First of all, uh, thanks so much for uh, yeah for joining me at, uh, at this podcast, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm really excited to uh, you know to learn a bit more about your uh, story, Arash. So today with us is uh, Arash uh, Azand, uh, Chief uh, Data Scientist, Chief uh, uh, Artificial Intelligence Researcher at Lindera. Um, hi, Arash. Hi. How are you? Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and you, all good? Yes, very fine. I'm also very curious and happy to talk to you about Sweet. this very interesting topics. So, uh, yeah. yeah, awesome. So let's, uh, let's get, get yeah. right to it. I, uh, so uh, if you could tell me and, uh, and the people listening to this, um, you know, a bit more about what you do at, at Linera and what you folks are, are building and creating in the world of uh, machine learning. Yeah, sure. Uh, so um, just to, to have it uh, in kind of um, in visual terms, so what we do in uh, the, at Lindera mm -hmm. uh, from this point of uh, artificial artificial intelligence uh, is to use this uh, very uh, interesting uh, novel techniques uh, that are called AI technology uh, for the usage in uh, med medical technology. Mm -hmm. uh, our focus, our main focus, uh, what we started was uh, uh, to bring um, computer vision algorithms uh, to um, detect human skeletons for the purpose of uh, uh, walking analysis. So we do, uh, we take videos of uh, senior people and extract uh, the skeleton out of this uh, 2D video mm -hmm. images in three-dimensional space and then try to calculate um, parameters of walking. For example, uh, step lengths, uh, step times, uh, walking speed. Uh, because we know from the medical standpoint that these parameters are uh, specifically important to assess uh, um, medical disorders like uh, uh, prevalence of falling in older adults. <laughs> so, um, there is a medical body of medical research on this uh, impact of the several parameters uh, on predicting whether people are more prone to fall or not. So, so how does it work? You uh, you use those uh, extracted features, as in uh, those uh, yeah parameters, as you call them, uh, of uh, walking, uh, and you use them in uh, separate models. So, so there is a bunch of models built on top of those uh, those parameters that are later uh, served, um, you know, as an API or uh, or just built in the tool, or um, or there is a sort of model for each and every one, uh, each and every disease, if you will, and you're extending the, just a library of diseases. Can you tell us a bit more about how that does that work? Sure. Uh, it's um, uh, the technology of uh, Lindera, so these, um, the core technology is uh, actually quite universal. Uh, it's not uh, specifically for any disease or a group of disease. It's just uh, taking the video and extracting uh, coordinates of uh, joints. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, imagine you have a skeleton uh, and a human skeleton, you have these several joints like knee, ankle, uh, mm -hmm. shoulder, and stuff. Sure. And uh, you want to um, have the coordinates uh, of these joints over time. Mm -hmm. For example, when you have the joints of the foot uh, over time, when people are walking, you can then use these coordinates to calculate other parameters. So from that view, it is just universal. You can 
uh, use this uh, technology, this uh, skeleton estimation for elder care. You can use it for uh, sports feedback. You can use it for uh, rehabilitation. Uh, mm -hmm. It's uh, there is no limitation to it. It's uh, quite universal. Mm -hmm. So, so as I as I understand, you have this uh, you have this one model for ROI. So those uh, you know those different points. So that's one uh, you know one sort of extraction model that uh, that is able to to get that from uh, from images and, and video, I presume. Um, yes. Yes. And then uh, and then on top of that, you build um, you know you use this. Uh, extracted knowledge to to build your uh, product features, if you will. Yes, yeah. So uh, what we do is um, we uh, build, uh, in some sense, a kind of uh, uh, SDK, so software development kit, which mm -hmm. uh, the core has this uh, skeleton tracker, mm -hmm. and on top of that, we could just uh, build modularly other tools. That, for example, take these uh, coordinates and do something else with it, and then uh, uh, calculate some other stuff and give recommendation to people. For example, mm -hmm. recommendations uh, when we find out uh, something is wrong in the walking of a person, then we could just extract, uh, calculate some um, parameters, and then say, okay, you have asymmetry in your left, uh, left right uh, walking. Mm -hmm. So we would recommend to you to do this specific uh, physiotherapy mm -hmm. two days a week. Uh, and these, uh, these other steps, so this uh, uh, extraction of these uh, parameters and also uh, to give recommendations are um, uh, tools or um, usages that build on top of this core technology. Got it. Got it. No, it's uh, it's really cool. Yeah, and when, when you say uh, when you say we, uh, you know, you uh, you and your team, uh, mm -hmm. can you tell us a bit more about about that? How how big is the team? How do you you know how are you organized? Like there is a small group of people working on each feature, if you will, or um, uh, or or how do you yeah how how are you structured? Yeah. So Lindera as a as a whole, is um, at the moment I would say we are uh, around thirty people mm -hmm. at Lidera, and uh, Lidera comprises uh, contains uh, several teams, uh, several team types. Uh, we have a sales team together with our CEO and CFO that are trying to. Um, uh, push forward our uh, product technology to customers. Uh, we have a customer success team, which is uh, uh, the team uh, members of customer success team are going to the customers, uh, make introduction of our product at the customer's place and uh, give them help and service and tries to get their feedback to us in order for us to improve our product. Uh, then we have an uh, IT team, just a standard uh, uh, IT team, which is developing front-end, uh, back-end or back uh, system and yeah. also the app. And um, then at the core is the data science, which is actually doing uh, some of my responsibility area, uh, my team. And in my team, we are at the moment together with me, six persons. Mm -hmm. And uh, we uh, develop these core AI technologies. We develop the core computer vision, then the recommendation, and also the gates, uh, the walking parameter uh, modules. Uh, and so our main focus in data science is um, both research and development. So uh, we are, uh, I would say, Data science at Lindera is maybe um, much more research centered than uh, other companies. Maybe mm -hmm. uh, also to my own experience when I compare it to other industry uh, companies, and also in comparison to my time at the university. Uh, our data science work at Lindera is really extremely research centered. That means that we. Uh, 
mostly don't have the technology or what is behind the technology beforehand. We have to find out uh, what is out there. We have to read the uh, publication, the research, the, the forefront of research and try to extract the knowledge out of it for us and then decide which uh, part of it is uh, for us usable and how we could develop it in our mm -hmm. systems. Mm -hmm. I got it. And so, then, so, so you, you mentioned you mentioned your uh, your time at the university. Um, let's let's talk a, a bit more about about that about your path to uh, you know to this uh, to this moment right now. Like how did you how did you get to uh, you know data science and and eventually how did you get to being a a chief uh, yeah a researcher? Yes. Um, so my background is uh, in uh, physics. Mm -hmm. uh, I just uh, want to step back uh, uh, more than uh, two steps, three steps uh, in uh, back. Uh, I would say uh, my um, uh, love for interest for physics uh, started from my curiosity to understand nature, mm -hmm. to understand what are the, um, the I, I would say, the hidden causes of uh, natural phenomena. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just before I even started to study, I was very uh, interested in, uh, for example, in the uh, universe and cosmology. I read a lot of books back in the school about mm -hmm. cosmology and wanted to go in some sense to uh, uh, astrophysics. Mm -hmm. but this was my uh, yeah, early, uh, let's say, a lot. And uh, eventually I started to study physics and this was, was very good at the Technical University of Berlin because we had a very nice uh, uh, astrophysics department and also a very nice professor. We mm -hmm. just did the, uh, the studies from a very philosophical standpoint. And this is also what was very uh, interesting for me. So I just was very interested uh, on physics from the philosophical, from scientific uh, uh, philosophy area. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was just... Uh, like uh, like everyone, everyone in cosmology, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, that was nice for me. So I just uh, uh, started to study physics, but eventually during uh, my time there, got more uh, interested uh, to uh, uh, biophysics and also the um, uh, self-organization self in complex uh, biological systems. And I was very curious to understand how, for example, these uh, very complex systems in biology, like we humans, for example, uh, or even smaller, um, beings uh, like insects even are able to uh, uh, manage these chaos around so they are able to just uh, live in this chaotic system to get energy and then uh, transform it to uh, to living mm -hmm. and uh, this self-organization principle in biological system was very uh, interesting so i eventually went into this area and uh, did also my PhD um, at the uh, uh, the field, overarching field of statistical physics of complex systems, and try to understand uh, uh, pattern formations in these complex systems. You can give, I can give you an example for that, which, which is very mm -hmm. visual. Yeah. Uh, visual. Uh, you will find. Uh, uh, in everywhere in these complex systems, some uh, universal patterns. One of it is uh, spiral uh, waves, mm -hmm. uh, so spiral shaped waves. Uh, you will find it, for example, in uh, human brain and human heart, but also in uh, insect colonies that they, for example, uh, try to organize themselves uh, through waves. And these waves are mostly kind of uh, spiral shaped. And we, in my, during my PhD, I studied this uh, formation of these uh, spiral shaped waves 
in chemical systems sure. and try to understand it from there and then uh, uh, to understand it also from well, specifically for other systems. Sure. No, oh, that's uh, that's interesting. And now, so how did you spiral out of that? Like, how did you? Sp- yeah, uh, did- yeah. This is interesting. Uh, so actually, I did my PhD and also did two years of uh, postdoc base. And at postdoc, I did uh, some also very interesting research uh, in uh, formation of crystals, a uh, mm-hmm. very special crystal which is uh, um, uh, not organic. So not living systems, but uh, still uh, are resembling uh, uh, those of uh, of living systems. They have curvature, and uh, though they still are uh, inorganic, and so I just did some experiment and uh, simulations on these crystals. Uh, but then uh, on in the Meantime, I just thought about, yeah, what is the future? So what will I do in the future? Will I go to uh, academia or will I step out of academia and go to uh, industry? And my decision was actually to go to industry because I I saw more of a kind of, uh, for me, uh, a way to do research, uh, let's say high-end research in the industry than uh, University, specifically mm-hmm. because I got uh, very interested in uh, uh, artificial intelligence topics. Uh, I must say uh, that uh, during that time in university, when I got interested in uh, uh, biological systems and complex systems, one of that the systems which uh, interested me maybe the most is the human brain. Hmm. So. Uh, I was very curious to understand, okay, what, how much is human brain? How are we able to just uh, um, infer uh, knowledge out of the world with this organ? Mm-hmm. And um, so I was very uh, curious about human brain and then on the other side, become last years more interested in artificial intelligence. Uh, which you may know is um, in some sense kind of uh, influenced by neuroscience. Uh, so the uh, neural networks inspired, yeah. inspired uh, the artificial neural networks in some sense inspired by neuroscience. And so my uh, one of my major uh, motivation is maybe uh, over overall, maybe even at the site of uh, uh, work at industry, to understand maybe also the um, link between uh, original neuroscience and current AI. And, and did, so, you, did you find it? <laughs> did you yeah. find the link or only the inspiration? Uh, at first I found the inspiration, but uh, more and more uh, of the latest research, uh, um, also in the areas of artificial general intelligence uh, uh, is trying to get more a bridge between these two again. So it started maybe with inspiration, but now more and more people see, okay, artificial neural networks are um, a specialist, uh, inspired by the specialized kind of algorithms to maybe detect patterns and data. But it doesn't tell us the causal relationships, links between these different phenomena. Uh, so more and more people also try to get uh, um, combine these artificial neural networks with more of uh, other area AI research, like for example, probabilistic models, Bayesian mm-hmm. inferencing. Mm-hmm. There is, for example, this area of uh, the, the Bayesian brain hypothesis mm-hmm. in neuroscience. I've heard of it. Uh, which is tried to trying to uh, it actually has the principle that they say the brain in some sense is a kind of brain Bayesian machine, which is getting the input uh, through the senses uh, or senses from the uh, environment and tries to model this input in the internal models, mm-hmm. and so that we just even try to match what we see. Mm-hmm. Or here, yeah. Or take, yeah, like this, this is generation. Yeah. This generation from a few samples and generation from yeah, um, yeah, like uh, not a lot of information. It's sort of 
feels like there's gotta be some some modeling uh, yeah. on the side of, of the brain, and then you update, of course, after every iteration of new information, after every batch. Right? Yeah, yeah. So you do have you have a kind of internal generative model, mm -hmm. which you just sample out and then compare with your uh, sensory inputs and try to match them <laughs> and uh, to get better in this. And yeah. so, so it's not only from this philosophical standpoint important, but also for us here in Indera uh, to, to get new uh, uh, ideas and tools for our problem solving, decision making. Mm -hmm. So when we have also um, uh, not so much data in our area, how to get, for example, such stuff like uh, one shot or zero shot learning, mm -hmm. uh, which is a very I, well, uh, I, one shot. One shot. I I have heard about a a, a zero shot. What, what is that? Can you can, can you tell me? Uh, yeah, zero, zero shot. shot is just a kind of uh, just in um, kind of uh, maybe uh, in uh, visually is uh, when you just. Uh, um, try to generate without any data first, generate a model and mm -hmm. try to sample and then uh, uh, get kind of so internal, internal from your internal models, uh, samples and try to infer what may be happen in the future. So wait, so, uh, so something where let's say I've, 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 uh, I've trained my model on 10 classes and then you know I'm I'm seeing a new observation, and I infer that it's a new class that will be a zero shot learning or not really. Yeah, so, in some sense, yeah, yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's very new, so I just um, uh, many people have maybe last one or two years uh, thought about it more to get mm -hmm. it into this uh, uh, AI area because. Uh, Actually, the state is that we need a huge mass of data to train our networks. Uh, but uh, but the question is, what can we put as prior knowledge? Mm -hmm. What can we use as prior knowledge mm -hmm. to direct our uh, neural networks to, mm -hmm. to specific uh, directions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, especially since it's uh, it's definitely you know the space of potential, um, yeah, like observation sampled from uh, from the feature space of of all images. It's not you know it's that there is bulks of things in, in certain uh, smaller areas, but it's not you know it's not uh, sampled randomly. It's just like I mean, there is a there are, there are those bulks of uh, of things that are image like you know yes, yeah. things that are not image like like that are. Yeah. yeah, signal like or yeah, sorry. yeah. That's interesting. That's interesting. So, was that uh, was that what you worked on uh, getting out of uh, university first, uh, Bayesian brains and uh, general uh, <laughs> generalization? Uh, no, actually, uh, when I uh, get got out of university, I first uh, uh, started as data scientist for another company. Mm -hmm. And my uh, um, working uh, daily work was just uh, to um, uh, do uh, predictive modeling, mm -hmm. analytic modeling for um, in the area of electronic sports. Mm -hmm. So you know these are these uh, esports uh, teams sure. are uh, 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 have championships and. Uh, uh, the products of the company called Dojo Madness, where I worked as data scientist, was to uh, develop analytic uh, tools for these teams on the one side, for example, to um, uh, analyze their uh, gaming behavior and also the behavior of their opponents and then mm -hmm. give them recommendations to, uh, in order to improve their mm -hmm. gaming mm -hmm. behavior. And the one thing was to for betting. So, for example, predictive modeling for uh, eSport betting, hmm. where I worked there. But uh, then after some time, I just uh, stepped out there and um, started soon here at Lindera. That was by November 2018. Mm -hmm. I left the university by April 2018. 
mm-hmm. and uh, started uh, then the meeting here at Dojo Madness in November at Lindera. And I started at Lindera because uh, uh, the data science work here at Lindera is much more reminiscent of my work at the university. Got it. So it's more of uh, um, reading uh, these publications, the scientific publications in this area to extracting effectively the knowledge mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. and to understand uh, them uh, and to, to see uh, immediately in which direction uh, we could go with this uh, scientific knowledge that is mm-hmm. out there and use that for us. Mm-hmm. And so it's uh, kind of really iteratively, um, so an iteration between um, reading the uh, novelties in the area, finding out what is out there uh, new. So I, th- I, th- I think that, that touches really nicely on, on the next, next thing I wanted to uh, yeah. talk about, which is, uh, you know, sort of how does your average day looks like? You know, is it, yeah. is it actually there is a part of the day that is for reading papers, part of the day that you spend on, uh, you know, managing the team? Uh, could you tell us a bit more about that? Sure. Uh, so uh, one part is for for sure this uh, reading uh, newest research. So I uh, uh, developed for me a kind of um, uh, a way where I just have uh, gathered uh, newest research and then I uh, set for me a kind of plan uh, to read them and then mm-hmm. extract the knowledge effectively out of it and write it down in kind of documentation, what I found out. This is one part of the day at the moment. Mm-hmm. Uh, another part is just... Uh, do, you, do you share that with the, with the team later? Yes. Uh, is it yeah. something like it's, it's sort of team-wide uh, strategy that you have, like everyone needs to write it down in a specific way? Yes, we have uh, started to... Um, we are doing uh, our whole uh, development uh, um, in a kind of a Kanban style. In what, sorry? A Kanban. Oh, yeah, sure. A Kanban style. Mm-hmm. So we have the tickets uh, for the classical development, like our mm-hmm. teams also do. And we have to, uh, we started uh, to do that in some sense also for research part. So we, uh, when we, uh, not only me, but also some, uh, other members of my team who are also research focused um, um, try to read and develop uh, the stuff uh, to test uh, everything which is in some specific paper and then write the documentation and write that directly in these Kanban tickets so that we can just uh, discuss mm-hmm. it down and see, okay, what is the, uh, the momentary uh, state of our research? Mm-hmm. So what, what did someone of us find already out? At which area we should not go further? And so that we don't don't invent the wheel, as I say every time. Yeah, again. yeah, no, and it's easy to to fall into that. Yeah, yeah, this is so actually the um, so our uh, idea or our implementation at the moment, and we're uh, iteratively uh, developing also on this method. We have to review it every week uh, and mm-hmm. see how it functions. Uh, and when it does function in some ways, how we could improve uh, also mm-hmm. this methodology. And awesome. No, I, th- I think we have to talk about it uh, about it uh, a bit more uh, after maybe maybe you know a blog post about uh, good research practices would be in place. Uh, yeah. So I'm definitely gonna talk to you about that later. But now, um, you know, so you said like a part of your work is, uh, you know, is in this, uh, this, this sort of, uh, uh, yeah, like getting, getting the, the research that is out there and uh, extracting the knowledge that could be actionable and, and usable in your, uh, your work. What are the other sort of like major uh, parts of your, you know, day-to-day activity? Yes, um, uh, another major part is also um, for me, but also for my uh, team members, uh, um, development of, uh, of course, of uh, when we have decided to go further in one year in, in a specific area to say, okay, we found out this paper is good and promising, uh, so uh, we should develop that. And then we, uh, we go on and say, okay, 
uh, let's uh, let's see if there is uh, code out there that we can <laughs> test, and then we go there, and someone of us uh, step in and say, okay, I will uh, uh, go into this development and uh, test this code and try to develop myself and research these <laughs> uh, findings and to document that, and then um, uh, this uh, serves as a kind of uh, first uh, proof of principle of mm -hmm. a kind of tool or algorithm mm -hmm. uh, on that we can later then decide if we put it in our production system. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this is the, the applied development area. So we mm -hmm. then step really in and uh, hands on and develop and program this stuff. Uh, and I'm also in that. So I'm, I'm Mostly the last times maybe research, but also try to develop uh, specific areas uh, in code. And um, how about how about because uh, a lot of the times people working, uh, you know, those uh, chief of data science positions, that huge part of the the work is communicating stuff to the to the business or uh, yeah, like. Uh, uh, make, enabling people getting the infrastructure in place or getting, yeah. you know, getting the access to the data or the legal stuff or stuff like that. Like, is it, is it, uh, in your case, is it, uh, also a big part of your work or? Uh, yes, is it, yeah. yeah. It, it shifted more. So I started as a, as a regular data scientist at Dendera. Uh -huh. And uh, for one year and uh, after one year, there was a kind of, uh, uh, fluid, I say, uh, uh, time of two or three uh, months, which was kind of transition time, where I just uh, transform transition to the cheap AI, mm -hmm. and during that time, more and more, I just uh, um, then stepped back on this uh, pro from this day-to-day uh, -day development, yeah, and more or less just try to. Um, um, get it to my team, to team members, and to give them the, the tasks of this development and uh, more and more go into this um, uh, overall strategic uh, development and communication. So mm -hmm. I'm just kind of a link between the data science team in this sense uh, and the our business and uh, customers. I see. Uh, was it was it something that you you sort of didn't expect when uh, you know like that was it was this something that you you know you didn't think was uh, such a big part of of your job or um, you know was there anything unexpected when transitioning from the role of a contributor data scientist to a managing data scientist? I, the, the interesting thing is it was uh, uh, not uh, unexpected to me because uh, uh, I'm coming from a, a physics area where when you just, uh, uh, of course not for all physicists, but mostly when you do PhD and some research teams, uh, you uh, naturally, naturally are at some time driven to this uh, management uh, task. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you just have to uh, uh, advise and manage, uh, for example, master students and other students and also try to develop kind of uh, research ideas. Uh, from that standpoint, it was not new for me. And the next uh, thing what helped me was the year before at Lindera when I just uh, worked as data scientist um, and more and more uh, was advised by a former chief. Uh, From the top leadership. Yeah, top mm -hmm. leadership to, to see how it's going on. And, uh, and the interesting thing, what I found out before I took over the, this uh, chief position, I had some kind of uh, anxiety maybe internally, say how, how would it go on and would I yeah. be able uh -huh. be able to but from the moment I stepped in and internally in some sense there was a kind of switch inside hmm. of me and my brain and said okay and I, I knew I, I can do it so I hmm. just was much more calmer and much uh, 
much more self-esteem and the moment when I stepped in because I just had uh, suddenly um, this feeling that is perfectly fitting me and my character to, um, to lead this team and to give the advice to my team and mm -hmm. uh, listen to them, to their ideas and to understand what are uh, their strengths and to understand how I could uh, uh, take their strengths and use that for uh, the uh, um, for the, the data science uh, and the could you could you uh, uh, you know because of course call you know this communication and understanding the strengths and the weaknesses of of your uh, you know coworkers uh, is going to be extremely valuable. Uh, do you have any tips or uh, tricks that you're using to sort of uh, uh, yeah, like first maybe classify, you know, those uh, particular features, if you will, of, uh, uh, of, of, of your uh, colleagues. Uh, mm -hmm. And then, you know, how do you, yeah, how do you work around it or how, how do you actually enhance or help people improve in some areas and then, you know, put people in position to be the best of themselves, uh, etc. Could you talk a bit more about that? Yeah. Yeah. Um... I think there is, uh, one has to maybe um, divide that in uh, at least in two parts and kind of soft skills and hard skills. So uh, um, the interesting thing is that I had the uh, impression that the major uh, uh, skills, the needed skills are more the soft skills because the hard skills like the uh, research ability and also the development and programming skills uh, are kind of uh, uh, craftsmanship. Mm -hmm. What you learn uh, during the time of uh, university and after that, it's just uh, uh, craftsmanship that you have to uh, do for a while and mm -hmm. then you can do it. Uh, the, the major thing is in such a leader, leading position, the more uh, soft skills, like for example, the ability to um, listen closely, I would put it that way maybe. So it's just not uh, just yeah listening, uh, writing stuff, but just to 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 see and uh, behind the person. So when you listen to your to team members and see, okay. Um, how do they convey the idea? How or how do, do they, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, communicate these ideas? And mm -hmm. uh, uh, how are their feelings when they communicate this? Uh, then you have to uh, be also kind of uh, 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 visible to you. I I call it kind of uh, having an eye or feeling. For uh, not only the, the hard facts, what they say, but also how do they feel when they just say, okay, I will have tempers and I have this issue, and how do I do that? And, um, and my sort of core skill I found out, so what is important in this area is, yeah, when you find out if uh, one person is very, um, um, uh, likes it in a specific area to work, how can you just put him or, or her in this position to shine? Mm -hmm. To give, uh, give the person the, uh, the feeling that he or she is really um, a valuable member. Uh, appreciated for uh, appreciated and also brings in ideas. So maybe just you have to um, give the also the the true impression to the people uh, that they developed an idea. Give them mm -hmm. the, the room and the space uh, to develop ideas and bring it up to you. And uh, you are in some sense, I say, kind of vulnerable from your side. You just just catch the ideas mm -hmm. and then try to integrate these ideas in the, uh, in the overall strategy of uh, your team and also the company.
So you have specific uh, key uh, goals from these uh, companies, and then you had decide, okay, we develop in this area, in this area, and then I see, okay, uh, this team member is very research uh, yeah, centered. Focus, uh, centered and he or she is very great at uh, research and likes to really read these papers and extract knowledge. Then you have to put them at this position mm -hmm. and say, like okay, that. and you have to, uh, to uh, give them the impression that they, ha they every day um, would love to come to work. G got it, yeah. Say, okay, the, the leader is just uh, behind me and also pushes my knowledge to the, uh, to the teams. For example, uh, it's a good uh, leadership to, uh, when you are in overall meetings, for example, to let your team members shine. Mm -hmm. It's not about you. It's, uh, uh, you don't have, be, you should not be ang ang anxious that you see, okay, I have to put myself forward because it's my position at stake. No. And so your position is just uh, that your team is functioning mm -hmm. and everything else will come. So mm -hmm. when, uh, when their team is delivering, uh, then um, you you have done Yeah, a ultimately that's the that's the goal, you know, and, yeah. and yeah. figuring out how to best best do that, that's that's your job, you know, how to best um, yeah. you know, help people um, yeah. be the best members that they can be, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, any other skills, uh, you know, and other skills that you think are, you know, crucial to, uh, you know, to, to the leadership role, but, uh, but more importantly to the leadership in this very, very researchy uh, data science. Uh, yes. Yeah, I think uh, from, uh, from the position of the leader, uh, who is, uh, for example, as a data scientist, as, as a regular data scientist uh, working in a team, you do your tasks on a daily or weekly basis and mm -hmm. uh, uh, do finish that and then you document your uh, solution and everything is fine. Mm -hmm. But from the leadership position, uh, you have to bring in also some kind of uh, ability or foresight, mm -hmm. uh, I should call it. So you have been specifically um, uh, demands from customers and business side mm -hmm. and then they come to you uh, uh, regularly and say, okay, at this time, at this time we go, we have to go into this development and deliver this to the customer. Uh, you have to be able, uh, from what you know from your team, by empathy in some sense, uh, to understand, okay, what is the strength of your team? What can they do? What is their ability in this time window? Uh, to deliver and mm -hmm. without uh, pressuring them in a kind of inhumane way mm -hmm. uh, because when you don't have I uh, have seen it across the university or industry this leadership when for example people just uh, don't have this foresight to see okay what is the ability of the team and how and uh, in which time window we can deliver and they just do it and promise to do to the business without knowing if it's possible. Yeah. Yeah, it's that everything is going disaster. Wrong. Yeah, disaster. And this is maybe one of the also the most difficult. And I cannot say for sure uh, that I'm um, I um, on it. So time will tell. <laughs> if I uh, I did it correctly, but at the moment I just uh, self awareness uh, is the first step. <laughs> yeah, so I at the moment I tried to just uh, uh, get kind of uh, uh, ex um, so an impression of it, but on the future I have uh, what we will try is more a kind of analytic way into that hmm. uh, what we call here a kind of decision intelligence. Hmm. Um, which is a kind of new discipline in the data science area. So some call it the machine learning plus plus or data science plus plus, hmm. uh, which is just uh, uh, putting all stuff from the other way. So it doesn't uh, ask uh, uh, 
for data and AI at first place, it first asks what are the decisions that we want to do. Yeah, what is, that, what is the business side of things? What is the problem yeah. that you want to solve? Yeah, what is the problem that you want to solve for, from business and customer side? Yeah. And then to, to cause the, the diagram, uh, by a diagram, cause a diagram to mm -hmm. model that. Mm -hmm. To see what are these uh, specific uh, nodes yeah. mm -hmm. uh, which uh, influence each other and mm -hmm. at each of these links you can you can then insert specific uh, models or automations automations mm -hmm. and when we have that uh, we will have a kind of uh, a more uh, scientific uh, approach to, to it and not a kind of uh, mystical uh, yeah uh, no, and actually, like the, the, the when, when you have it, when you finally build it, uh, when you build your model, you build your your solution, which might have been extremely difficult to do. There is value driven out of it. Like there is value that you you drive home, that you give to your customers, uh, that, yeah. you give, that you bring to the business. So that's, yeah. uh, I think it's, uh, yeah. Like I remember, I've I've been on the sort of a, yeah, like the solder, if you will, uh, end of the stick here, where you would. Uh, you know, you would actually build something which ended up not being very useful because we did, we just, you know, we just thought that this is the way, like, this is the problem that we can solve. So we solve it, you know, but this is not a problem that anyone wants to, uh, wants you to solve. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, you just, you just thought it was a, it was a good thing. But um, I forget yeah. about somebody, somebody said that this is a third, um, uh, the third, uh, the of uh, third, like a type three error. Um, yeah, sure. yeah. Sure. 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 That's true. Yeah, that's a major. That's one uh, uh, major description. Of uh -huh. that. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's uh, that's that's. Yeah, I really like that. I really like that. I think a lot of organizations are doing things in that regard. Um, something I wanted to ask, you, and you know, sort of uh, again, sort of uh, similar again, but a, a bit different. Like, are there, um, you know, what were the f things that you think are crucial now that you needed to learn? Uh, you know, sort of progressing in the field, uh, yeah, like that are crucial now that you didn't, you didn't, you didn't know when you were, or you didn't, uh, yeah, know how to handle where uh, you were just an individual contributor. Yes, um, so one, um, I think, um, um, major uh, thing is to the uh, communication part. So yeah. when I just uh, um, was at the university. And then before I, so when I left university and came to industry, one a major thing I had to learn uh, was the uh, uh, communication part. So because when you are at university, specifically in that you read the physics uh, is, uh, or specifically in physics uh, uh, area, uh, you're only responsibly, responsible mostly for your work. Yeah, you do your research, and so uh, you can do some research uh, the whole year, and then write something, and then um, you have no specific other responsibilities. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you're just in a company, and in most companies, you have to, on a daily basis, uh, learn to communicate uh, better uh, mm -hmm. solutions, but also. Um, how do you approach these mm -hmm. ideas? You have to communicate immediately. Also, your failures. What are the things you want to try, and then uh, you know yeah. why you want to solve them? What do you need? What yeah. is going to happen? Stuff like that, right? Yeah. Specifically, I can give you a visual example. For, uh, awesome. When I started uh, uh, data scientist, I just approached that uh, via uh, standards researcher. I just. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, as a perfectionist, I just mm -hmm. tried to, for a week to solve one specific problem because I had this impression, I have to do that. Uh -huh. There's this internal feeling, I have to do that. But at the end, it was just uh, not a major problem issue. Mm -hmm. And I just uh, lost mm -hmm. a lot of time into mm -hmm. uh, uh, micro research and uh, micro improvement while the major stuff. Uh, uh, was not done. Mm -hmm. uh, I just had to uh, force me to just uh, do prior priorities. 
Mm-hmm. So how, how did you how did you work on that specifically? Did you have a checklist that you go over, or uh, there were uh, maybe some you know lectures or books that were really impactful? Uh, how did you approach that? Yeah, I uh, just um, uh, books were uh, also major help. I just uh, tried to um, I read some books in this uh, 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 agile uh, programming area. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, some also about uh, how to uh, prioritize, but I think uh, mostly uh, um, the major help was actually to to talk to to other people who have this experience before for a mm-hmm. new company and working with me, and then mm-hmm. uh, just lose this uh, anxiety to to say okay I have to be perfect by myself. Uh, I don't ask anyone when I need help to just get rid of it and go to people and say, uh, here, uh, can you help me? I'm stuck. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to uh, go further here. And maybe you have, and people are uh, immediately stepping in. So because they have this experience, I learned that uh, they had this experience beforehand also. Mm-hmm. And then are immediately uh, prepared to help you and say, okay, yeah, just step back and then, uh, think about the, ma- the major issues. How can you solve that and that? And then um, I just lost this uh, anxiety to do. Uh, to, uh, so asking, asking for help, huh? Yeah, asking for help, it's, it uh, sounds very... Uh, Trivial, but it's maybe one of the uh, most difficult when you come into uh, a kind of company uh, environment to learn that, uh, to see, okay, uh, I'm not obliged to solve uh, all problems by myself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's just, and, and also from this uh, leadership uh, uh, perspective, uh, to make a circle to that again, it's also very important when you just... Uh, uh, a leading position to give your team the impression they they always uh, can come to you or to any other member and ask for help. Mm-hmm. When in your team, for example, uh, also a recipe for disaster is when there is a kind of uh, 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 wrong or bad uh, Championship, uh, yeah, competitive, uh, environment. competitive environment where people just uh, uh, hold stuff for them because they have the impression mm. uh, other people will steal it from <laughs> them, and this uh, uh, this is a bad environment. So you have your team should have the impression that they all work together at the end. Do, do you have any methodologies or systems in place that uh, sort of facilitate that discussion and exchange of help in, in your team? Oh, yeah. yeah, so at the beginning, I just, uh, when the people are new, I have to I try to, uh, from start to tell them, okay, uh, these stuff are very difficult. No one of us has the, uh, the major solution to it. So uh, don't be afraid and uh, to come to us, and ask us uh, when you uh, start. Um, this is just a soft uh, approach to it, but um, the, uh, the systematic approach by me is that I just, uh, uh, on a, at least monthly basis, but even on a, a more regular basis, I just uh, Try to talk to the one on one. No, one on one, huh? One on one to uh, to special person. I say, ask them, okay, how is uh, their uh, working life? Uh, is it everything uh, is fun still? And are the, do they have a problem to go on? Mm-hmm. And to, to try to just be kind of uh, step back and let them to talk. And to understand, okay, um, is there a problem? And uh, when you just uh, give this environment to people psychologically, 
um, uh, and are open, then people just open up also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, I, I see what you mean. I've seen that. I've seen that happen when yeah. uh, people just sort of grow in your eyes. So if you will, like they, yeah, like it's 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 quite 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 nice to see when it happens. Yeah. And also um, to, for example, tell them uh, when there are specific problems that you already know, okay, which uh, other team member is good at that and that can help. Mm -hmm. and so that there is also kind of working together. And then also make an exchange of who's good at what. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we want to try also to get more into this knowledge transfer, both in data science and also maybe overall in Madeira. Mm -hmm. But first, in data science, uh, one of our major uh, um, uh, work in the future is to implement kind of uh, a knowledge transfer system so that we also internally present mm -hmm. uh, to our team and uh, uh, give them understanding from all perspective so that they also learn and grow. So mm -hmm. people who, specifically in data science IT, when the people have the impression that they uh, learn and grow during the work they do, it's also kind of perk. Yeah, no, I agree, hundred percent. Yeah, and the other way, like I, I have a lot of friends that they, you know, they leave or they, they, they left their, their, uh, you know, good positions because they were just doing the same thing, you know. And um, and that's not something that drives a lot of people in uh, data yeah. science. I think you know, like a lot of people want to learn. Yeah. 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 Um. Uh. What would be the let's say there's three tips that you should give to uh you know to a uh, to data scientist to a junior or regular you know person just uh just a regular contributor uh you know working uh in data science towards the beginning of your uh, career journey, what would be the, the tips, uh, you know, tips that, that, uh, that you would uh, you would give them to progress in their careers faster and, and uh, yeah, and uh, overall just get, have a better experience uh, doing it? Yeah, uh, so when I just break it down to maybe two or three uh, tips, uh, I would say um, uh, to, uh, to analyze first when you go to your junior data scientist, maybe coming from university and uh, are uh, really happy to come into this area and uh, work here, uh, I would advise uh, uh, you to uh, maybe first analyze the uh, company as a whole, but also the data science. Uh, look very carefully uh, into um, the team structure, how is the, for example, what kind of uh, data science leader is there? Uh, do they give you kind of uh, room or space to improve? Uh, are there people who just uh, uh, are in some sense also diverse in their uh, um, expertise? <laughs> are there researchers and uh, uh, people who are more at applied, uh, who can give you more perspectives than a team which is just one, one way. Uh, this is one tip to, to really look carefully what kind of people are there, how do they treat uh, you and also the other mm -hmm. members. Mm -hmm. And um, the other uh, major tip uh, I could give is to even if you're uh, or maybe uh, more centered to uh, data scientists who are coming from a research area, mm -hmm. maybe when they come from like me from mathematics or physics area, I would give them a kind of advice to um, to do uh, kind of intensive uh, courses, maybe online courses beforehand on. Uh, on uh, hard skills like uh, specific programming courses. Uh, uh, with me, for example, just to break it down to Python, uh, what I learned uh, on a hard way, but it was very, very valuable, to, was the craftsmanship. So I had, uh, I was physicist, I had uh, done a lot of research, 
but really just the craftsmanship of, of programming on mm -hmm. day to day to be really fluent. With all the, and, all the CIs, GITs, and uh, GIT, uh, GIT, architecture yeah. design. And, uh, architecture design and also these uh, the, the libraries too just specifically uh, uh, take for example pandas as mm -hmm. a kind of library for uh, data frame uh, hacking handling, I yeah. handling uh, to to know how to do that like like it's like you uh, uh, speaking a language fluently mm -hmm. you communicate much better with people when yeah. you're not overthinking stuff, uh, uh, when you're very fluent at these uh, craftsmanships, um, your brain will uh, free, have uh, will have free uh, space, freedom, freedom to, to creative stuff, free, free, freedom to cre be creative. Mm -hmm. And uh, I learned, for example, that when I don't have that and have this craftsmanship. Uh, I lost a lot of this uh, time and uh, ability for creativity. Hmm. So this is one next major uh, uh, advice uh, and uh, maybe uh, the next is also to, to see, to look, is there in the company uh, an environment, a friendly uh, learning environment. Do they uh, uh, provide you the space to uh, to learn also new skills, to grow, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or is it just uh, kind of uh, do your job? What I, yeah, what I call more not a data science, but more kind of data engineering, just uh, pushing data. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, not not to say anything bad about data engineering. No, no, it's uh, a uh, very uh, very uh, important, valuable. Uh, For sure. No, no, I I agree hundred percent. You know, I think yeah. I think it's sometimes even undervalued on the side of uh, yeah. how much uh, freedom it gives us. You know, in data science, yes. Industry, you yes. Know, you don't have to handle all the you know all the all the stuff uh, that happened behind the scenes. And this is maybe also coming from this as another major um, uh, advice, which is more also on my first advice to analyze the team structure. When you have, when you are at the team, which uh, uh, who have also very uh, uh, skilled data engineers mm -hmm. and uh, maybe also uh, some uh, uh, DevOps mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, who are very good, then it's also a major thing for a team. So because it's as you told, it takes gives the data scientists a huge freedom. Yeah. And being creative when you have I agree. data engineers and DevOps. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. I agree 100%. Um, I think we're getting to, towards the, the end of this. Uh, 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 something that I you know, wanted, uh, wanted to ask as a last, very last question for me is, uh, are there any books or resources, blogs or podcasts or things like that that you highly recommend for anyone, you know, coming from, both from the research size, uh, side of uh, things, but also just from regular data science courses? Is there anything that you want to recommend to the listeners of, of this? Yeah, so one thing um, which I can recommend uh, for sure, but, and also I think most of data scientists who are actually practitioners uh, maybe know that already, but I would recommend to step uh, more into it and also to uh, pay for it in some senses. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Medium, for example, mm -hmm. uh, the Medium blog and uh, towards data science mm -hmm. as a kind of part of Medium. Uh, mm -hmm. I, for example, decided to um, uh, to uh, pay for one year basis every year, mm -hmm. and uh, to read articles. And I, I'm uh, really uh, into it. And uh, uh, every uh, second or minute free time uh, during travel or uh, city and also evening before sleep, uh, I try to read this. Uh, interesting articles uh, which are uh, published there uh -huh. to get these uh, impressions about uh, novelties and 
uh, what is out there. So this is a really a valuable resource. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, otherwise, I just, uh, uh, yeah, read papers. Read uh, papers is very, very uh, in important in this area. Um, to, to understand also papers, to extract knowledge from it. Uh, from books part there, um, I found uh, for me personally most valuable these uh, gen general books. Not, mm -hmm. uh, uh, mostly not the specialized, uh, let's say, deep learning books, which are mm -hmm. also valuable, but mostly the um, so the general concept books, uh, like uh, like uh, lean programming or stuff like for that. For example, for example, from the programming part area, the, it would be that. Uh, from data science AI, uh, mostly these uh, uh, so more general AI books. So what uh, which try even to go more into AI philosophy and neuroscience to get kind of other ex uh, uh -huh. experience, not to read the same thing that you uh, are doing the whole day. But I see. Get exposed to some other, other stuff that can inspire yeah. you to build, uh, build new things. Yeah, in physics, for example, as a, a specific sample, uh, I always try to uh, read uh, more philosophical uh, mm -hmm. books and also sometimes novels even, mm -hmm. which are completely different, to get the kind of other impression. It's also, for example, what uh, Einstein told, uh, this was why I think I cannot re recall the exact thing, but he told, for example, when you just stuck uh, in your work, just uh, step back and read something else or do something else, walk around and do some music, for example, mm -hmm. and then come back and suddenly you have... A, the uh, problem solves itself. Yeah, you have a complete <laughs> different idea and everything is okay. I agree. I agree. No, thanks for that. Definitely. Definitely. I'm going to ask you for, uh, for some of the, the titles, potentially maybe some Authors that you really like on, on Medium, if there are, and include some links to, uh, you know. Yeah, sure. This. Yeah. Um, so just uh, just a final sort of uh, final final question is, uh, you know, is there any message that you want to uh, leave our listeners with uh, um, going in the future? <laughs> yeah, I think the major message that I can uh, uh, give to the listeners and viewers is that. Uh, um, maybe when they have uh, the impression or they want to decide to go into this uh, AI area, uh, to my uh, impression, it's uh, maybe uh, the best time uh, to be here because uh, uh, I have the real impression that the next uh, one to five years, major uh, improvements will come. Specifically into in some kind of uh, artificial general intelligence, maybe it's not the real one, but in some sense, these uh, uh, the um, the uh, um, combination of our current AI with uh, uh, other areas of uh, science will. Uh, lead to major improvements and uh, it's maybe the best time to be here because I have the impression that we, uh, um, you can uh, reach major, uh, uh, major research successes uh, in this area when you start now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Arash. It was, uh, it was a pleasure to meet you, pl pleasure to speak to you. Uh, a lot of interesting stuff. I, uh, yeah, I'm really happy that, we, that I had a chance to, uh, to do this. Thank you so much, Arash. Yeah, I thank you also and for the opportunity. And, um, it was a very interesting interview. Okay, that's it for today. Thank you so much for listening. And till next time on Machine Learning That Works a podcast hosted by Neptune AI.